The following interview was conducted with Mary Alice Niebel, Niebel, Professor Emeritus of Consumer Sciences and Retailing for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Tuesday, January 13, 2009 at her home in West Lafayette. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Library. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Tell us a little bit about where you were born and your parents and early years. I was born in southern Indiana, in Spencer County, where Lincoln spent his formative years, um, and also near Santa Claus. I was um, born on a farm that my, had been in my family for three generations. Um, my father was Edgar Tableman. My mother was Anna Bond Tableman. Uh, I'm an only child. I many times jokingly told people that my parents were old enough to be my grandparents because my mother was almost 43 when I was born and my father was 45. Uh, I was born in 1937. Um, as I said, I'm an only child, but I am the youngest of, there were five cousins in my family and I was, they always considered me their one and only. So I had uh, a lot of you know, good feelings about my family and so forth. Um, my, I knew only my grandmother on my father's side because she lived with us. Uh, she passed away when I was three, and but I do remember her. And she was an invalid and uh, for many years and because of a stroke. And so my mother uh, had to take care of a baby as well as her mother-in-law. So, well, Tell us about grade school and high school, what activities and where you what size of the school, etc. I went to Elm Corner Grade School, the same grade school that my father and my uncles, his two brothers, attended. It's a one-room red brick schoolhouse. Um, I attended grades one through eight there. When I started, I was the only girl in a class of six. And it wasn't until I was in the third grade that there were any girls in my class. And if I remember correctly, there were probably around 30 students in the school. And one of the advantages of a one-room grade school, in my opinion, is that when I finished my studies or my assignments, I could listen to the older classes and learn from them. I had um, um, two really good friends who were kind of like my sisters, older sisters. Uh, one was Billie June and the other her sister Joanne. And um, Billy was, I guess, in three grades ahead of me, and Joanne was probably five grades ahead of me. But um, they had um, told me as a little kid about school and what went on in school. And so I was most anxious to begin school, begin first grade. And I can remember that my dad took me to the school, which was uh, about a half mile from our house. I didn't even let him go on the grounds. I took off and ran and climbed up onto the porch underneath the bell and, uh, and went into that class, into that schoolroom because I was so anxious to start, start school. I, um, my first grade, uh, my, I rode with my teacher, with Miss Alberta, to Elm Corner. She lived in Lamar, which was the address for my home area. Uh, and she picked me up to take me to school. But then, going home in the afternoon, I had to ride the, quote, high school bus, driven by Raleigh Masterson. And um, there is one woman that I always consider her my, um, uh, well, not savior, but <laughs> really, uh, she saved me because so many of the high school guys would, oh, tease this little kid who was six years old, 
And Wilma Hipschman said, always saved a seat for me and said, you can sit by me for a half a mile. You know, it wasn't very long, far to drive. Um, but we, um, I had three teachers in grade school. I had Miss Alberta for the first five years, Mrs. Reed for the next two, and oh my gosh, Amy, can't remember her last name, guess it doesn't matter, <laughs> um, who was a teacher in the eighth grade. And uh, Miss Alberta would always take us on field trips. And, um, you know, we would go down to held uh, the woods and uh, you know, do science, check on science type things and so forth. And, um, we also in, uh, would have in the spring uh, softball games with other one room or two room uh, grade schools in the area and that was always a big deal too. Um, they would have pie suppers to make money to support the school. Um, but, uh, you know, since this was Lincoln's area, of course, prominent in that grade school up above the chalkboards were two pictures, one of Abraham Lincoln and one of George Washington, which was uh, typical. Um, but we would, um, we had a great time in, uh, in grade school. Um, lots of um, oh, lots of uh, games that were played, but lots of studying too. And when you consider the, the how far so many of the graduates from Mountain Corner went, it it was a a sound school um, because after my third uh, after my first grade, um, Delbert Schriever became my, quote, school bus driver. He drove his car. He lived north of the school and brought the students who lived in that area to school. Some of them um, then would get the fire started and so forth in the winter. Then he would go west, pick up that bunch, go south, and I was on the east route. And... Uh, so I always tried to get out to the end of our lane, which was three-eighths of a mile, um, so that I could ride around with him on the whole route because he always had the radio going. And so that was always, you know, we had great conversations in those, <laughs> those times. Um, and so that was when, you know, he, he did the uh, busing of us both morning and evening. Um, from Elm Corner, I went to Christening High School. It's no longer there. It, it uh, went together with Dale High School to become Heritage Hills at Lincoln City now. Um, Christening High School, uh, well, I, I could have gone to either Christening or Dale, but my family did most of its business and, and other family members lived south which was the direction for Christney. So that's why I went to Christney High School. I knew two other people in that school. Um, Charles Chris was one of my classmates who had moved to, our, to Elm Corner um, this, with two weeks yet to go in the eighth grade. And another person was Joyce Patmore, whom I had known through youth fellowship and, and so forth. Um, so I decided that this was a chance that I had to become known not as Mary Alice, but I could choose. And so I chose to sign all of my papers, Alice Tableman. And uh, I, I think the reason was there were so many Marys in my family. I had, you know, two aunts, my great grandmother's name was Mary. Another great aunt whose name was Mary, and just lots. And I decided that I didn't have to stick with that name, and that worked for the first year. There were probably about sixty-five in my freshman class, 
And my sophomore year, um, a friend who came to live with her mother, whom I knew from our little uh, church and youth fellowship, uh, moved to go there to Christney High School. And she knew me as Mary Alice. And it, within a week, everybody in that school had changed from me being just Alice to Mary Alice. So I gave up on, thought, okay, my name is Mary Alice. Um, I had a home economics teacher who uh, said that if I was going to go to Purdue University and major in home economics that I had to take home economics all four years. And I said, no, I don't. And I took other more college preparatory classes and, uh, and I still came to Purdue. And, and uh, Had you given thought any other place or was Purdue your first choice? Purdue was my first choice and probably only choice because I was very active in 4-H. I was a 10-year 4-H member. And everything that you got about 4-H always had Purdue University on the bottom. And so I just knew that I was going to go to Purdue. And also another thing, uh, 4-H Roundup. I attended between my eighth grade and freshman year in high school. And I also attended Junior Leader Conference, which at that time was held at DuPas. But somehow Roundup kind of stuck in your mind and you said, hey, even though you had to get across the railroad track that <laughs> divided the campus, that was the place to go. Um, I always remember that um, when I was... I knew I was going to Purdue, and a friend who was um, a minister at Christ, at the largest, at the Methodist Temple in Evansville, a very large uh, church, and um, his wife was from our small little community church, and so I can remember him talking to my father and saying, you know, Mary Alice should come to Evansville College because Methodist Temple was right across the street. Their parsonage was there. I could live with them. I'd be only 40 miles from home. Um, they had two children, one two years older than me and one two years younger than me. And it would just be an ideal situation. And I can still remember my dad saying, it's her choice. It's not mine to make. We're supporting her wherever she wants to go. And uh, so that's how I ended up at Purdue. Okay. Um, I, um, what year did you enroll at Purdue? I enrolled at Purdue in 1955. Okay. Tell us a little about that and campus life and what your major and professors and were you in a sorority? Okay. Or did you live on, uh, you lived on campus? I lived on campus. Um, my freshman year, I lived in Doomy Hall where every night you dressed for dinner, you sat at a table and it was all very, very formal. Um, and you were served. And you were served, no question about it. And you, everybody ate the same thing and you didn't fuss about it too much. Um, my roommate was a young woman from Michigan who was an engineering student. Um, my major, I didn't know at that time that I was going to go into um, education, into teaching, but uh, it just kind of evolved that when I was went to my academic advisor, Lucille Wilson, you remember that name? Mm -hmm. um, when I went to her, and I can remember the some of the, you know, discussions that we had, and uh, I said, you know, teaching was what I wanted to do. Uh, I'm going to backtrack a second because when we had our 10th uh, reunion of graduation from high school, my one teacher who taught government said, Mary Alice, you vowed, you, you st would argue with me in class that you were not going to be a teacher. And he said, here you are, a teacher. <laughs> and I, I can remember that too. Um, 
I lived in Dumi my freshman year. The first day I was on campus, I went to a foundation, a church foundation picnic, whatever you want to call it. I shook hands with a young man from Pekin, Illinois, and uh, he, four years later, became my husband. Um, I was active with the foundation. I was active in V.C. Meredith Club. That's a name that is kind of... Uh, that club has, uh, of course, has long not been non-existent. Um, my sophomore year, I um, went moved into Antwidale Co-op House uh, because several of my friends uh, encouraged me, and that was a great experience because you could maintain your independence uh, while still being in a smaller group uh, atmosphere. Um, it also taught you a, some responsibilities that you wouldn't have had in other situations, in other living situations, because um, I was foods manager, which meant that I had to um, order all the foods and plan the menus and... Uh, that you had different responsibilities. I was treasurer of the house and, and so forth. Um, and I lived there my sophomore, junior, and senior year. Um, the courses that I took, of course, were the edu ones that directed me toward education. Um, swimming. Uh, in those days, uh, a woman, because men had ROTC, women had to... Uh, fulfill requirements in physical education. And I always teased my mother that she said that I couldn't get in a swimming pool until I had learned how to swim. And she, <laughs> obviously that was not a true statement, but um, I had never been in a swimming pool. And my first class, uh, first swimming class, because you had to either take eight weeks of swimming and pass the swimming test or take 16 weeks of swimming. And I took the 16 weeks, but my roommate um, was one who, after that first class, I, I can still feel it, um, she said, she knew that I was thinking of not fulfilling that, going to class that next time. and she, And she she said, if you don't come home with your hair wet because this was before blow dryers, she said, you're, you're, you're going to hear from me. So I, I did learn to swim. Um, I, other classes, uh, right after swimming, we had English composition. Three of us women were in the class. We all had swimming before it, so we walked into class with Mr. May, and looked like drowned rats the whole semester. <laughs> but, um, Where was the pool? In the Lamb pool was, no, oh. the pool was in the women's gymnasium, which is now the uh, computer science. Uh, which has now been named to the Haas. Yeah. And now it's a Haas mm -hmm, building. Mm. Um, when I was an undergrad, uh, the new, the building we now know as Stonehall, was built, um, and Sylvia Hart was a professor in, um, what was it called? Well, it's now uh, HTM, but at that time, uh, institutional management. And she had some women from AT who worked for her at special dinners and so they asked her if, you know, if I could help or she maybe asked if there were any others who would, might be interested. So I worked for her as, and I think made $2 for an evening of serving. Um, but then when the new Stone Hall opened and I was taking that class, that uh, service class, um, we... You know, she made sure that, well, she knew me, and she knew that uh, how I worked and so forth. And I will always remember one time when the 
of American Association of University Pro no, Professors, what is it? AAUP. AAUP. Met there, and President Hubdy was at the head table. And she assigned me head, the head table to serve. I was sure I was going to pour coffee right down President Hubdy's back. <laughs> you know, it was, oh, gosh. But um, I, I can still remember uh, her uh, ideas of how to make, thing, make foods more appealing. And, um, you know, that you slice bananas at an angle to give them a more interesting appearance than just round. <laughs> um, but one of the good things, we always got to eat whatever was served at those special dinners. And, uh, and ag school had um, the, what was it, the knighting of the loin or something to that effect. And they carried this uh, roasted beef in and, and we had to serve it. Oh my, that was a, I guess, maybe it wasn't the whole beef, but this big loin that they carried in. Um, I had some classes in Bunker Hill. Um, one of the classes that I had was Art and Design 104, and that was as a freshman, and our professor took us because that's when the Frank Lloyd Wright House was in the process of being built. So I always remember the um, elevated dining room in that house. Um, but that was kind of a treat to see. Now I think I appreciate it more than what I did because uh, that was a treat to see uh, that under construction. Um, so that was one class that I had in Bunker Hill. Another one was tailoring because that was when Matthews Hall um, was being renovated. And so we had tailoring over in, in uh, Bunker Hill. Jean Davis was my professor. Bunker Hill is, for the researchers, you can clarify that. Bunker Hill, that was a building? Bunker Hill was uh, originally a residence hall. And it was um, kind of the, not, not really Quonsets, but... Um, it, they were built kind of like an H, and they they had dormitory rooms, and had been dormitory rooms, and um, then they had removed some of the walls and turned into classrooms. Turned in classrooms and offices. C and T was the offices were there. Mm -hmm. Can't remember, but Jean Davis was my professor in tailoring, and uh, that's where I really learned. Um, I had always enjoyed sewing, and uh, so that's where I learned uh, about that. I did my student teaching at Fort Wayne Southside because coming from a small high school where there were 40 in my graduating class, uh, I wanted to go to a city school, which I think probably is... Um, it was kind of surprising, I'm sure, for some people, for some of the professors. Phil Slow was uh, my mentor, and uh, uh, she was fantastic. Um, and later, when I had her as a graduate student, I know she said, she took me aside one day and said, Mary Alice, and that was when I was teaching elementary, uh, she said, if you ever need a job, just let me know. And I know that there would have been no problem. I would have mm -hmm. would have uh, been a, gotten an assignment because of her. Um, let's see. What else do I know, remember? Well, what about athletics? Did you uh, part, attend athletic events too? I attended athletic events, uh, not regularly. I didn't have season tickets. I attended uh, basketball, football. Uh, the card section was a thrill to be part of which at that time it was freshman. I remember walking around the stadium as a senior with my derby hat and my cane and wearing my cords. In our house, uh, the wearing of cords or the hiding of the cords was a big deal. I think I hung my, uh, uh, hid mine in a detergent box or something. Anyway, uh, but that was a thrill. Um, I also 
um, enjoyed convocations, uh, whether it was varsity varieties, but also when the uh, performing people came in. Um, I remember I attended my first opera at Hall of Music. Um, and that's one of the reasons that I feel very strongly now about giving to the Friends of Convocations is because some of that money goes to help students who have not maybe the foggiest idea about what a symphony is, or um, right. I, you know, you can it can be all around you, and you not not be aware of it. Right, so, exactly. Uh, let's see, what else did I do? I I never participated in sports, but uh, you were a partic- You were um, in the audience. I was in the audience. Attendee. Uh I loved the band. I still do, and I think that that is one regret that I have and that is that I didn't try out for the band for Purdue band because that was is such a, a special group so yeah. now when did after what year did you graduate I graduated in 1959 okay and then what what came next before you came to Purdue um did be, you stay on oh you mean Purdue? before I came to yeah. Purdue did you stay on after graduation um I graduated on May 31st 1959, and on June 7th, I was married. Uh, And my husband and I lived in Lafayette for one year. I taught at Monitor, which is now a halfway type facility. Um, I taught junior high, home economics, science, and I had responsibility for the school lunch program, planning the menus. And uh, to, today, or at, at Pura events, um, oh my gosh, what's Ruth's last name? Well, anyway, one of my cooks, one of my colleagues and cooks, um, comes to Pura uh, events. Um, I've lost it, what her name is, though. Um, but I, I taught, as I said, home economics. I taught science, 7th and 8th grade, and then the, the school lunch. I was also in charge of, I taught physical education. And I always remember one student after, I always participated with the kids in whatever activity we were doing in phys ed. And I always remember one time one student came up to me and she said, why are you different? The teacher before us sat on the bleachers and watched. And I said, well, you know, that's not the way I like to do things. So, um, But it was kind of an interesting reaction. I always, one thing that stands out in my mind about Monitor is that they have the open fire escape stairs, or had, I should say. And one of my seventh graders had to help me down those steps because I've always had trouble with heights and more so now. But at that time, even, gosh, walking down those open things. That that was scary. Um, William Francis was the... um, I thought maybe I'd remember Ruth's name if I remembered some other people. William Francis was our principal... Um, I, I've lost it as to who it was. Later. And, yeah. um, was your husband taking some classes at Purdue? Was that why you stayed on one year? Uh, he, he had gone to Purdue, obviously. Mm-hmm. He was in, majoring in chemical engineering. His health um, deteriorated, and so he dropped out of school. And he got a job because I was still here. He was a year older than I. Um, he got a job at Guarantee Auto and worked at um, Guarantee Auto. And then, you know, because he had a job, then I, um, you know, got and got the teaching position. It was a, a good distance. It was four hours from my parents and three hours from his parents. So, you know, it was drivable, but we were also on our own. Um, but 
John would go with me to various school activities. And he would help me, you know, grade papers and things like that. And he saw how much I was enjoying teaching. And although he had taken a, uh, an interest test um, when he was in high school, and um, I think that he was kind of a, a quiet uh, individual at that time, and uh, they, the results came back that he should never go into anything that involved working with people. He was more directed toward research, technical, and so forth. And so, but he found that he thoroughly enjoyed teaching. And so, he, and he wanted a degree, but he didn't want it from Purdue because he felt that um, he, you know, he, he just didn't have really good memories, maybe thinking, not correctly, but thinking that that had something to do with his health deterioration. Um, he was in Triangle as an undergrad, um, and to this day, I go to Triangle reunions of that class, um, which is, I know all those guys. They were my brothers. I lived at the house as I was an undergrad. But anyway, our first year of marriage, um, we decided to, we were going someplace. We were young. We had no family, no children. Uh, our parents were, we were both only children. Our parents were, um, you know, good so that we didn't have to worry about taking care of them at that time. And so we decided to look into schools. And he wanted to go to uh, University of Arizona in Tucson. And I said, that's a dirty, dusty desert. I don't want to live there. So we compromised, and we went to what was, at that time, Arizona State College. It's now Northern Arizona University at Flagstaff. 7,000 foot altitude, the great San Francisco peaks, the gorgeous Ponderosa Pine, and um, we were there. We went there in 1960. I took a job as a secretary at Navajo Ordnance Depot. Um, I didn't know what what they that they stored bombs there because of the um, um, climate and and so forth. Um, when I went to the um, office to check about various types of positions that might be available, and they said, "Well, what are you looking for?" And I said, "Oh, you know, working in a bank as a a teller or something." I, I, I knew that there was no teaching positions available because when uh, the secretary to the admissions officer, I guess, had uh, had uh, written John and he had indicated that his wife had a teaching uh, degree and uh, she wrote back and she became a good friend of ours. Um, but she wrote back and said, that there were no teaching positions available. So I knew that before we ever moved out there. Um, we lived in a little old apartment. On, it, it was a maid's quarters in this big old Victorian house. Um, there weren't too many apartments in Flagstaff at that time. Um, and, but they were given, the government was giving a test. And um, so I went out on a... Friday afternoon, I took the test, and no, it wasn't a Friday afternoon, it was Thursday afternoon. I took the test, uh, yet another young woman who was the wife of one of the basketball players for Arizona State College lived upstairs in the apartment in this big old house. Um, we went out together to, because there was, we had uh, tied for the <laughs> top scores uh, on that test, alphabetizing, you know, that kind of stuff, and typing as well. And uh, we were interviewed, and um, I was, I interviewed with a man by the name of Kermit Hendrickson, and this was down in, 
uh, director of supply operations. So this is where they had to keep track of all the bombs that were stored and so forth. And um, the other gal got the job because um, she had worked as a secretary. I never had. And, uh, but I went to, we went to a mission church on Sunday and the personnel officer there attended that church and said, stay home tomorrow because you're going to get a call. There was another person who had resigned that Friday afternoon when I had gone in for the interview and um, that I was going to get the call. So, and I did. I went in on Monday afternoon for an interview with a gentleman who was originally from Berea, Kentucky but he was the um, civilian executive officer at NOD. Um, and he hired me. <laughs> and um, then when I, and I had to have a physical and all of this. And when I went to work, I think I had one day in between. I started work on a Wednesday. And I walked into his office and he informed me that he was loaning me out that I was going to be loaned out to procurement. I didn't know what procurement meant. My father-in-law was a, um, what, what's the other name for it? Anyway, a purchasing agent, but procurement is the term that's used in the military. And so um, he took me upstairs in the, this building and uh, my the man who was going to be my supervisor was busy at the time but the colonel the commanding officer of the whole base was up there talking to uh, another of my supervisors and i looked at the nameplate on the man's desk who was going to be my uh, supervisor and i told uh, the gentleman that took me up there right now i've lost his name too mr fugit I said, I don't even know how to pronounce that name. He said, that's okay. They, everybody just calls him Jess. It was um, He was Mexican-American. And so it, his, the name of Enigus was not in my vocabulator, uh, vocabulary at that time. Um, so I was in procurement then for two years. And then when my husband um, passed away, then I moved back to southern Indiana. And, Did he pass away while you were living there? Uh-huh. He passed away when we lived in Flagstaff. He had gotten, he, he did his work for his math and science, chemistry and physics uh, major teach of education. He was able to complete that, all that he needed in one year. He didn't have to take any physics, any chemistry, any math because of all that he had had at Purdue. And um, so, but in order to teach in Arizona, at that time, now I don't know whether it's still the same, but at that time you had to have at least six hours completed on your master's. So we lived on, we moved on campus in a brand new quadrangle um, a couple of months after we moved out there and lived in this uh, apartment. And then um, he, um, he was doing his student teaching. And I remember coming home from work this one day. And he, and he got home shortly after. And he said, we need to sit down and talk. He had been offered a position to teach there in the Flagstaff, Flagstaff school system which is very unusual to, at least at that time, it was very unusual to be offered a position while you're still student teaching. But Mr. Cromer, the superintendent of schools, had come, taken him out of his classroom and said that he wanted, gave him this offer. So we had planned, and at, over the holidays, when we had been home visiting our families, we had gone to Southern Illinois, and we both were admitted for graduate work at Southern Illinois. And so then, 
we had to make a decision. We had two, two weeks to make the decision as to whether we would stay in Flagstaff or whether we were coming back to the Midwest. And it didn't matter what decision we had made before we went to bed. Every night for those two weeks, one of us would sit up straight in bed in the middle of the night and say, we can't do that. And the next night, probably the other person, we can't do that after we had, you know, decided. And so finally we said, okay, we don't have to be back in the Midwest. Let's do this. So we uh, then he went to uh, summer school and um, then had, was teaching mathematics and physics. And, um, or was it chem? No, it was chemistry. It was mathematics and chemistry, and he wanted to teach uh, physics. And that spring in April was when he landed in the hospital and uh, died in July. He had three major surgeries within 11 weeks. Um, and, but while he was in the hospital, the super, the principal, came to tell him and, and have him sign his contract and he could teach whatever he wanted. He, he had it. And, but then he died in July. And then I came back to my home in Southern Indiana and lived with my parents. And uh, I arrived home on a Saturday and on Sunday, um, one of the members of the school board of this elementary school three miles from my home um, was there to talk with me and to ask me to come to the board meeting on Monday night that uh, they were considering me to teach sixth grade and so I had all sorts of support in community certainly family and community people and, and uh, so forth and so I accepted that teaching position. Well, in the state of Indiana, you have to get seven and one half credit hours in order to maintain a permit. Now, I don't know whether that's changed since the 1960s or not, but I, and so that was when I started going to Kentucky Wesleyan in the summer and they had five week sessions and you could get, um, six hours or sometimes seven hours in one five-week session and but you couldn't get seven and a half you know beyond that and i i even you know contacted the state and said what you know i can get seven nope had to be seven and a half so i ended up going to two five-week sessions in the summer of 63 because I came back in August of 62. So in the summer of 63, I, t I did 13 hours of credit. Also, the excess hours beyond seven and a half don't transfer over to the next year. It has to be seven and a half new hours. Well, it made me get my certificate done. And um, I had my advisor at Kentucky Wesleyan was a former Elm Corner student with me. He was, I think, three years older than I. And he had gotten his doctorate at Ohio State. And I went into his office and he said, oh, Mary Alice, you have, and he was talking about the good old days back at Elm Corner and so forth. And he said that I had to take a child development class. I said, Walter Lee, I've had it. I had that class at Purdue. And fortunately, I kept my papers and books and so forth. And uh, finally, no, that, that wasn't right. Well, I attended the first class and he started using me as an example of how it was and in the school and what we looked for. And I thought, I'm gonna have five weeks every day of being the example in that class. And I thought, I don't need this. I've already had the class. So I went to him again and I said, 
I really have had this. I don't need this to be repeated. And so he let me off the hook. So I didn't have to. Um, let me think. So I got my ele elementary certificate. I taught um, sixth grade and I taught home economics to the seventh and eighth graders. I taught physical ed to the fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth graders um, for from 1962 through the spring of 1967 for five years. Um, I, um, what was I going to say? I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I had one year, I had a class of 40 sixth graders. I had no teaching assistant. Half of the class needed remedial help. I had within that class was three kids from the same family. One turned 16 while she was in my class. Uh, another was 14 and another was the age that he was supposed to be, but they were a transient family that had been moved and moved and moved. Um, but I, so I came to, I decided that elementary teaching was not going to be my life. I loved the kids and I wanted to do what I could to help, help them. And I was in a community that was very supportive of education. Um, but I decided I didn't need to handle the discipline problems that went along with elementary school. And so I decided that I was going to start work on my master's. And um, I knew I wanted to go to uh, come back to Purdue. And um, I did so. I registered the first time for summer school with Dean Vale uh, because the head of the department, it was Jean Davis at the time, and she was in Chicago the day I came up. So I worked with the uh, with Dean Vale and she said, I, I thought I was going to take three classes, or two classes three hours of credit each, which is what Jean Davis had suggested to me in our uh, conversations. And I will never forget Dean Vale sitting on the other side of that big old desk, kind of, you know, and this tiny little lady, but very strong lady, said, why are you wasting your time? Do you have family here that you are responsible for? No. Are you commuting? No, I was living at, at a young grad house. Well, there was no sense in wasting my time. I should take nine hours of credit. I didn't know what I was getting into, but I did it. And I did it for two summers. And, and uh, the next summer, um, I came up to register for class. And that's when Peggy Conti was the new head who had come in that year. And um, she uh, wanted me to come for um, a regular, you know, fall and spring session. And so I did that. I um, contacted my superintendent of schools and made an appointment that to go in and to tell him what I was going to do, that I was going to come back to grad school in the regular semester. And I walked into his office and he said, you're here to tell me that you're going back to work on your graduate work. I don't, I, to this day, I do not know how he knew about that because no one in the area had heard it from me I, the only thing that I can think of is that Peggy uh, called for a, for verification, for, you know, whatever. But anyway, I, and I assured him that that was the reason I was there. And uh, so then I came back to Purdue in the fall of 67 because I had teaching experience you know, graduate students weren't supposed to teach the first year. 
at least, uh, certainly not the first semester, but because I had teaching experience, they put me right in the classroom along with my classes. I graduated in um, 68. In February, I was going, leaving uh, in the afternoon for an interview at Berea College in Kentucky. And uh, Peggy came to me, she, my major professor, uh, of course, had told her that I had this interview set up. And I met her in the cafeteria and she said, Mary Alice, we have to talk before you leave. So we conversed right there in the cafeteria and she offered me a position. And so, and I said, but I have to go on this interview. She said, yes, because she didn't know how much she could offer me, you know, anything like that, but she wanted me to stay on. And so uh, I went to Kentucky. I interviewed with the, or to Berea. Uh, I interviewed with the president. The vice president took me around. Of course, it's a small little campus. And I remember that the president, as I sat in one of the rockers that's made by the student craftsman, uh, said, how do you feel about working with students who have to work X number of hours while they are in school? And I said, that's no problem to me. I was raised on a farm. I lived in a co-op house. <laughs> you know, that wasn't any problem. And so then I came back and I was hired in, oh, I had a, a job offer before I left campus at Berea that day too. So, uh, but then, and it was spring break, maybe it was in March, I don't remember. And um, so then I had contact with Peggy and I was hired for here. And the department was? Clothing and textiles. And I taught um, the beginning clothing construction class and the sociological aspects of clothing. Um, the second year that I taught, I was made um, director of the text, undergraduate textiles uh, class. And um, I also taught tailoring, not the lecture part, but the lab part. Um, and it was always interesting because in 1977, I think it was, um, Fern Rennebaum was then head of the department and she called me into her office and said, Mary Alice, Dean Compton wants you to come over to administration and be in academic advising. And my mother was in the hospital at that time and I was going home, it was on a Friday afternoon, and I was going home, and I talked to myself all four hours going home. My mother was not in, the, in a state that she could help me think, think through this, so I thought it through myself as to whether I wanted to accept giving up teaching, because I absolutely love teaching, and I love the interaction with the students. And so I decided that it was an opportunity that I was being given. And so I accepted. And then in 78, I think it was 78, I've lost track of the time. Hold on. Um, excuse me, 77 was when I um, went over then as academic counselor in CFS. And what were some of the, your duties and responsibilities and your interaction with the students? Mainly in talking with students about the opportunities available in the school, in the majors, um, trying to help students match their um, strengths with various programs, with programs within the school. Um, I was also responsible for the auditing of all the graduate records and um, let's see mainly that was it but uh, well and advising students being an academic advisor and uh, as to what courses registering for them, them for classes but it was at that time uh, that they, we were changing over 
so that you had um, academic advisors in each department. And it, it had started like the year before. And so I was an advisor in CNT this one year because Kathy LaFuse is my first advisor, advisee, excuse me. Um, but uh, when I was in Stone, those first years, you mainly worked with students who were undecided and, and didn't know exactly what, so that you had to be, had to know all the programs of study and, um, you know, work with that. Right. Okay. And work with the, um, what do you call it, the uh, school catalog, making sure that everything was all right there. Okay, very good. Um, Let's talk about, uh, how about some uh, the strategic plan? I didn't participate mm -hmm. in working on the strategic plan the at school? all. Uh, had we had the school strategic plan, and this was when I was, um, I don't know whether I was director. No, I was assistant dean, I guess, for undergraduate uh, studies. Um, so the only part that I had in strategic planning was basically attending Dean's Department Heads meetings where you heard about this. But I Then you moved from the advising into uh, to the deanship. Uh, is that uh, okay? And Did um, that change? I moved to yes. Uh, when I went from advising to um, the assistant dean, I did that with um, what was Don's name? Can't think. Um, but then he named me uh, the assistant dean. And then when Dennis Saviano came as dean, I remember him coming into my office one day and said, Mary Alice, since you're administrator, I don't want you advising students anymore. And, but yet I was director of student services or assistant dean for student services. And I said, how can I expect to know how the students are feeling, what's going on in students' lives, unless I have some contact from that aspect of student life? And uh, when I retired, he used that example in his, in one, in his statement uh, uh, at the reception because... Um, he he said that I had said I would be I would quit before I would do that. I'm I don't, I'm not sure that it was that strong, but uh, anyway. Um, but with that certainly came uh, new responsibilities uh, and working more because um, I was also quote the head academic counselor in the school as well as being assistant dean. So that meant that you attended all sorts of meetings across campus. I worked on, uh, I was representative from our school on the accreditation, uh, the group of, of uh, those of us uh, in the head academic counseling offices about the learning, student learning. Um, I worked extensively with the registrar uh, regarding, <coughs> excuse me, graduation. I worked also with the registrar in um, working on athletic athletes' academic records, and that was one that always put a feel of fear in me because I thought if I make a mistake as to how many hours the student has toward a degree, but they assured me that you know there were others who were looking at it too, but. It, it was a big responsibility. Mm -hmm. 